patience. Good evening, attending a remote community meeting hosted by King County Wastewater Treatment Division and the Coal Creek Sewer Upgrade Project. I wanna thank everyone for taking the time to join us this evening. And before we get started, I wanna make sure that everyone is aware that this meeting is being recorded for people who are unable to attend this evening. We'll be reminding you now, and we'll also be reminding everyone again about the recording before the discussion portion of this evening's presentation begins. The image on the intro slide is of Coal Creek winding around a bed of stones in between trees at the Red Cedar Trailhead. Because we'll be hosting an open discussion, we want to remind everyone of some community expectations we have to make sure that this place is safe and respectful and a place where people can share their thoughts. Please respect others in the chat and when giving verbal comments. Anyone that uses abusive or harmful language or actions will be removed by the host. Um, we also have some accessibility options available to help people participate this evening. We will be providing ASL interpretation as well as live captions. In the next few slides, we will go over how participants can customize those options to their needs. I also want to share with everyone that there is a phone number available if you need tech support throughout the presentation and throughout the webinar. The phone number is 206-922. 6236. Again, that's 206-922-6236. Um, that number can also be found in the chat if you need it. So first things first, um, if you are interested in accessing closed captions this evening, they will be available throughout the presentation as well as the discussion. Um, based on your previous experience with Zoom, captions may already be turned on or off. To toggle the captions on and off, um, please select closed captions icon at the bottom of your screen. It may also say live transcript, so I'll be using both of those words to describe this. And then once you click live transcript or closed captions, then you can click show subtitles to activate the captions within the Zoom platform. If the captions provided by Zoom do not support your participation and you are looking to customize your view, um, there is a link posted in the chat box. By clicking this link, you will be able to customize the size, the font, and the color of the captions. Um, that link will also provide in-language captions if you are looking for translated captions. Um, the link will open a separate tab in your web browser that you can um, view alongside our presentation this evening. On that link, our auto-generated translated captions are provided in Chinese, simplified and traditional, Korean, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. We also have ASL interpreters present with us tonight who will be interpreting the meeting. Um, to best view the interpreters alongside the presentation, please select view options at the top of your screen and then select side by side mode. Um, then, as I mentioned, um, the presentation tonight, we will have the presenters and participants with videos off so that the ASL interpreter videos are more easily viewable. If you'd like to only see the ASL interpreters um, throughout the evening, what you'll want to do is hover over their video with your mouse and click the three dots in the upper right corner, then select view participants with the videos on. We will have two interpreters this evening that will be alter alternating um, doing captions. So selecting view participants with video on will make sure that you see them at all times. All right, so we're here today to talk about a project that King County Wastewater Treatment Division will carry out in the city of Bellevue. This project will have impacts at the Red Cedar Trailhead during construction in the Coal Creek Natural Area. 
When King County's contractor restores this trailhead after construction, the project team sees opportunities to improve accessibility for people of all abilities. Tonight's briefing will be talking about just that, and it will be set up in two parts. First, we'll include a 30 minute presentation during which, as I've mentioned, all participants will have their video and audio disabled. Then we will have time for an hour long session where you can, where we will allow people to turn their audio on to submit verbal feedback. Um, and we are also allowing folks to offer feedback through our ASL interpreters. If that would support your participation this evening, please chat the panelists so that we can promote you when the time comes um, to a panelist so we can turn your video on. Throughout the entire presentation, nonverbal feedback is welcome through the chat or the Q&A options at the bottom of your screen. The slide that's showing at the moment has two images on it. The first image shows the blue trailhead sign with the trailhead name and address. It reads Coal Creek Natural Area, Red Cedar Trailhead, 5433 Coal Creek Parkway Southeast. The second image shows the trailhead itself. There's a gravel path with a log bench facing the viewer. Um, you have maybe, if you have ever Google Maps or used an online mapping function to get to this trailhead, be familiar with it as the Upper West Trailhead. For this presentation, we will be calling it the Red Cedar Trailhead. All right, and now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to our presenters this evening, Madeline Brown and Monica Vanderveeren. Hi everyone, my name is Madeline. Um, I'm a college intern working with the Cool Creek Sewer Upgrade Project this summer. Um, I'm working with Monica Vanderveeren, who leads the community services team supporting this project. So in the top picture on this slide um, is of me. I've got brown hair, I wear glasses, and in this picture, I'm wearing a white shirt and standing up. And I am Monica Vanderveeren. I am a community services project lead for King County Wastewater Treatment Division. What that means is I work with communities from the beginning to the very end of a large sewer construction project like the one we'll talk about tonight. Um, I may work with communities for many years in Bellevue with this project. It will be 10 years by the time we're done. This project's expected to be finished in 2027. I, the image of me shows me in my natural habitat working with communities. I, I'm very wash and wear, so I'm tall, I'm about six feet, and I have brown hair, wear glasses, um, and I tend to be dressing in sort of field gear on any given day. So I'm in a gray shirt and khaki pants, work boots with a hard hat, and we're giving a tour of an underground pump station to a community. This is one of the things I really like to do is kind of reveal the underground sewer system to um, our communities. Um, and then I wanted to introduce, we have a special guest um, from the city of Bellevue. We have been very fortunate to have really superb partners at the city of Bellevue and have really enjoyed working on this project um, because of that. So Blaine Amson is the, has a very complicated title, 88 Title VI Civil Rights Administrator. Um, Blaine has been incredibly helpful being a sounding board on some of the accessibility ideas we've come up with and also to help us make our communications more accessible. Blaine's uh, done trainings and published uh, a pamphlet on making more accessible meeting and meetings and events. And we really appreciate that perspective so that we can work to improve our practices. So Blaine, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Hello, folks, and good evening. I am so excited to be here, and I'm so excited to be able to listen in and hear from you, uh, the participants who are here in this meeting. I am, in fact, the Americans with Disabilities Act and Title VI Civil Rights Administrator for the city of Bellevue. It is a mouthful, and it essentially means that I am watching to make sure that the city of Bellevue maintains compliance for disenfranchised and disadvantaged populations. Uh, but what I'm here today to talk to you about is uh, is really the, the upgrade that we have an opportunity to make much more accessible than it currently is. And in that vein, because King County and the city of Bellevue 
are so genuinely interested in hearing what you think is going to be good options and opportunities for us to increase accessibility in outdoor spaces. We want to use this opportunity to hear your sun, moon, stars ideas. We want to hear uh, what it is, even if we don't integrate it into this project, we want to hear what is it that's important to you? What matters to you in outdoor spaces? Because the effort today, we don't often get an opportunity to hear from, from uh, folks with disabilities in such a targeted way. We want to hear what it is that helps you to be able to enjoy outdoor spaces so that even if we don't use it in this project, we can kind of put it in our back pocket and keep that in mind as we're developing outdoor spaces, as we're developing trails, natural spaces, those sorts of things. If you tell us something is important to you and you don't see it in this end result, it doesn't mean we didn't hear you. It just means that we are keeping it and we're going to work to incorporate these ideas into future projects. I'll give you an example of something that's just kind of off the top of my head. I am a, I am a wheelchair user and as a wheelchair user who likes to use outdoor spaces, um, one of the things that's really important to me is not just having a, a paved or compacted trail, but also that we have spaces to pull off to the side of that trail so that other walkers or joggers who are going by have an opportunity to get past me without it feeling awkward. So if I'm stopping to give water to my dog or check my phone or do those things that I need to do, I can feel like I have a space every, every little while to pull off and not feel like I'm in the way. And that's something that we may have thought of, or maybe we didn't. And it's important to hear from you kind of those things that matter to you. So you'll hear later on in this presentation, some ideas that we have that we think are pretty cool, um, but you may have different ideas. You may think our ideas aren't as cool as we think. We wanna hear what's important to you because we don't know. So don't think of us as the subject matter experts who are giving you information. Think of yourselves as the subject matter experts and we're excited to hear from you. So I wanna thank you for your honest feedback. Um, and I want you to know that we really, really hear you. And I'm so excited to be here. And as I close today, I will just tell you that there is a giant photo of me on the screen, uh, much, much bigger than I expected. And I'll describe it for you. In this photo, I have short spiky hair. Uh, I am wearing red glasses. I have a kind of white toned, button-down shirt with a suit jacket on that is pinstriped blue. And I have a pocket handkerchief poking out of the top of my pocket that is also blue with white polka dots. I also have earrings. Those are kind of the things that you would notice about me if you saw me in this photo. Hi, this is Monica. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, so I'm going to take credit for making the very large picture of Blaine. I am always so impressed by Blaine. He is, I, my pandemic hair doesn't look any worse than my regular hair. And uh, Blaine is always, aside from being such a great partner, so dapper and well put together. It's always so impressive. Um, so again, Monica and I am the community services lead for this project. Um, what I'm going to do is start out and give you a brief overview of the project so you understand why we're impacting the trailhead and what's going to happen there. Um, the first question that everybody always asks us, so if it's in your mind, that's totally fine. Why is King County doing a sewer project in my area? So if you're a Bellevue resident, you are paying a sewer bill to the city of Bellevue. And here King County is doing a giant sewer project in your area. In fact, I think we've had seven over the last few years in Bellevue. Um, so to answer that question, it helps to understand what happens when you use water and it goes down the drain. The image you're looking at here is a side-by-side -side image. It's got a change in the right from the left and I'll describe that. There are two bubbles at the top that show buildings. Those buildings are homes, schools, businesses, gyms, churches, mosques, everything that might be a building with a drain that people use. So when people use water, it goes down the drain into a small pipe on private property that's called a side sewer. That small pipe goes to a slightly larger pipe that's a local sewer line. So that belongs to a sewer district or a city, in this case, the city of Bellevue. The local sewer line goes to an even bigger sewer line that is the King County sewer line. The flows that we gather from 17 cities and 17 sewer districts 
are sent to three different regional treatment plants to be cleaned. So that's how the sewer system works. Because King County is serving all these sewer districts and all these cities, we have pipes everywhere. We have over 400 miles of pipes. And when those pipes get old or full or both, we need to upgrade and replace them. So in this image, as I said, it's a side-by-side -side image. On the left, you see these buildings and the sky is clear. On the right, you see these buildings and it's raining. So what's happened in the service area for this pipe, which is the city of Newcastle and part of Bellevue, there are more buildings and more drains. You've seen your area grow. So there's a lot more wastewater coming down to fill up the pipe, okay? Uh, side sewers and personal uh, prop, private property sewers get old. If you don't maintain them, they can start to leak. They get cracks or tree roots get in. And then when it rains, groundwater gets in the sewer and it adds flow and fills it up. When we project capacity, we project capacity for the number of buildings and drains, but also for there's a buffer in there for sewers getting old and leaking. So right now, the Coal Creek sewer pipe that we'll talk about is just about full in any given rainstorm. So it's really time for us to replace it. Next. So the image here shows our project area. What we are going to do is uh, build a new pipe with more capacity, we also have an opportunity to put it in a better location. So let me get you oriented to the project area. In the background is a light gray dove color. That is private property. All of that is private property. There are white corridors. Those are streets, they're travel corridors. And then we have irregular green color. They're a little bit darker shapes. That is all City of Bellevue Parks property. From the lower left to the upper right, you'll see a jagged line kind of winding its way through the Coal Creek natural area. Okay, that is the existing Coal Creek sewer. And it's built that way because it was built to follow the sewer. So in the 60s and 70s, the technology that was available, they just dug a hole in the ground and dropped the pipe in and followed the stream bed. The creek has changed, it's flood prone and it moves around. The other line you see there is a smooth arced line. So this line is over the top of the jagged line and that smooth arced line is the new pipe. Now what you're probably gonna notice is that that smooth arc line is mostly out of the natural area. We will be able to move most of the active sewer pipe out of the natural area and away from Coal Creek, which is a good thing. But you might be wondering, looking at this, that gray area I told you was private property. So how is this going to affect the people that live there? Next. The good news is it shouldn't at all. They probably won't even notice this is happening because here's what happened since the 70s, tunneling methods have actually been developed. So this started in the 70s, engineers found ways to install things deep underground and really limit impacts to the surface, whether it's roadways or homes um, or streams, any environmentally sensitive area, we can now do things deep underground that we couldn't do when this pipe was first installed. This image shows uh, it's a side view of the hillside above Coal Creek Parkway. So if you were standing on Coal Creek Parkway, this would be an image of the hillside. You can see the topography of that hill is very irregular, that big green irregular shape. On the top, there are small little black forms that are really not even easy to see. Uh, they are houses and trees. The reason we put them on there is so that you can tell, they're to scale, you can tell how deep the pipe is underground. So the pipe is the dark line that runs through that irregular green form. So how do we do this tunneling deep underground? There are two parts marked on either side of this image. In the, on the right is an entry pit and on the left is an exit. So at the entry pit, we launch a tunneling machine, that goes along and we feed it pipe segments 
and then it excavates dirt and send it back out the entry pit and it keeps going along until it builds the pipe and then we pull the tunneling machine out at the exit pit. So there's a lot of construction that is going on at the entry pit. So where is this entry pit located? Next. It's at the Red Cedar Trailhead. So we're looking at the same map we looked at previously with the two sewer lines, the dove gray background that's private property, the irregular green shapes that are City of Bellevue Parks property. There is a dark rectangle around the Red Cedar Trailhead area. This is where the entry point will be for the tunneling machine. The other thing we have to do, remember we have to take City of Wastewater, or City of Bellevue wastewater flows. So we need to reconnect this new pipe to the existing Bellevue system. So there'll be a segment of pipe that goes up the trailhead, trail going into Coal Creek. There'll be another segment of pipe that comes across Coal Creek Parkway. Yes, there will be traffic impacts. We will have another meeting about that um, when we know our permit conditions. But you see this area, and there's going to be a lot of construction that goes on to build the pipe, the new pipe and those connections. And then we have to do some stream bank work and restore everything that we affect. So what is it going to look like during construction? Next. Not the way it looks today, certainly. So the image on this slide is the view is if you were a bird or a drone over the site and it's a very industrial looking site. There are tanks and trailers and equipment and there's a long tube going across this. That long tube is the pipe going underground. The tunneling machine is pushing pipe underground in the entry pit. So this is a very industrial looking site and very different from what's there today. Next. So today, this image shows a wide gravel trail. You have lovely trees towering over it, even on a hot day. This is a very cool place. It's shady. It gets dappled sunlight. You hear the sound of the creek. It's going to look a lot different and sound a lot different during construction. OK, I don't want to soft soap this. It's, it's Construction is never really pretty. The Red Cedar Trailhead will need to close for up to three years. The reason I say up to three years is because we are working by a fish bearing creek. And when we go back to restore anything by that creek, we have to work in what are called fish windows. So if everything goes well and the contractor gets done and he's ready to restore and a fish window is open, he can do that. If not, he has to wait. The fish window prevents, it minimizes the harm to fish in the creek. So that's why we say up to three years, we'd love it to be less, but I don't want to mismanage expectations. During this time, there will be a trail detour. It is actually being built at this time. As I said, we have wonderful partners at the city of Bellevue. And what we are supporting is their well-kept youth employment program. They are building a trail detour that will not just be a temporary construction access, but actually a permanent trail. Um, and it will help people get around the site. Plus, as I said, it's a win for us. It supports youth employment. So we're very happy to be supporting a season of the well-kept program to get this done. So the thing to know about this trail and the natural area, it used to belong to King County, actually. King County obtained federal funding to establish this trail system. So under regulations, when a trail receives federal funding and it's disturbed, we have to restore to current ADA standards, OK? Those change a lot over the years. We years as people learn more, we develop more. There's a lot of change that occurs in a standard. So there's some options we have that the city didn't have the last time it was restored. Next. So today, the Red Cedar Trailhead is um, much more accessible than it was before the city of Bellevue did a culvert replacement project. It was a dirt trailhead at that point and they made it much more accessible and they put in a lot of really great stormwater control. The image at the right is a parking lot. There is a curb that curves around to the light, the right. The pavement changes color from a sort of duller gray, darker gray to a light gray. That's pervious pavement to absorb runoff from cars. There's a rain garden. There's a native plant buffer. There's a kiosk. There's seating. 
right? There's a lot more going on at this trailhead after they restored it. We will return this trailhead using the existing plan, right? We need to return the basics that were there in the first place. When we return the kiosk and the bench and the trail service surface, we need to restore them to current standards, accessibility standards. There are two things that we think need to think about protecting as we think about options to do things on the ground for accessibility. One is the environment. Everything outside of pavement or gravel is an environmentally sensitive area. It's a forest, a stream, a wetland, a wetland buffer. So we want to put any improvements in the pavement or in uh, on gravel. That's one of the things we want to do is protect the environment. As wastewater treatment division, we also like to protect our ratepayers' investments. So we're very happy for everybody to give us input tonight or as we go along because we're gonna come up with some ideas. I'm just about to turn this over to Madeline to talk about those. We'll come up with some ideas for accessibility, but we wanna invest our efforts and our funds where they will get the most use. So as Blaine said, we came up with some things, maybe we totally missed the boat. Maybe there's something else we could be doing that would make more sense. I would like all of you as you start to listen to these ideas, is it something useful? Would you use it? Is there something else we should be doing that we missed? Okay, and feel free to be blazingly honest with us. We really want to do the right thing on this project. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Madeline Brown and let her talk about some of the ideas we have for on-site improvements. Sorry, I think I might have been muted, but hello, this is Madeline speaking again. Um, if you haven't been to the Cool Creek Trail before, you might be surprised at how quickly the area um, transitions from cityscape to nature. You enter uh, the trailhead from a very busy Cool Creek Parkway, and then suddenly you're surrounded by trees, running water, you know, you can hear some birds maybe chirping in the trees, and you might be able to catch a fish in the creek. Um, as Bellevue has been working to reestablish a coho salmon run in Cool Creek. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're returning the existing trailhead features to current accessibility standards, which means that things like the trailhead kiosk, the bench and the trail surface um, will be changed, but there are also more ways to create accessibility that are options. And so those are some uh, that I will take you through now. Um, the picture on this slide is showing three fish swimming in some shallow water. All right, so um, on this slide, the picture on the left is showing the current kiosk. So that kiosk stands vertically. It's got a small roof over the sign um, and the sign includes a description of Cold Creek's natural areas, historical relevance, as well as two maps of the area. Um, in this picture, you can see a, uh, a, there is a woman standing up who's reading the sign, um, and there's a bit of glare that reflects off of the sign. So in the background of that picture, you'll also see um, the current log bench at the trailhead. So the trailhead kiosk and bench are both designed to fit in with an interpretive theme that focuses on historic logging and mining. Um, and we will be restoring the sign with a non-glare surface and accessible maps, as well as a graffiti proof surface that makes it easier for park crews to maintain. And so an example of what this uh, restoration could look like is the picture on the right, which shows a kiosk with a horizontal sign and a non-glare surface. Um, so by making the sign horizontal, the information becomes eye level for a wider range of people. Um, and a non-glare surface can help those who are vision impaired to more easily see the information present. Next. All right, so another option, it would be to put a bigger kiosk with more information at the trailhead. Um, and so we could provide more information to help people using mobility devices or managing fatigue to decide how long they'd like to travel because you know, some people might just be going there to sit and enjoy nature instead of walking the entire trail. 
Um, we can also add some nature information and interactive features for people whose disabilities would make the trailhead area their entire journey. So this picture on this slide is showing an example of what a bigger trailhead kiosk might look like. It's got three sides and it's got informational signs in front and to both sides of the person standing underneath the roof of the kiosk. Um, and this kiosk would be spacious enough for those with mobility devices to be underneath the kiosk roof while reading. Next. Okay, so this image is showing an orientation sign which focuses on information that helps people plan their trip and gives them important emergency contact information. So this is another option of something we could add at the trailhead. Um, orientation signs help people whose disabilities cause discomfort or fatigue to plan the right length trip, um, as well as helping autistic people who can benefit from knowing where they're going and where they are at. Um, and it could also help reduce sensory overload. So an orientation sign like this one could include information such as a trail map, locations of features along the trails like benches, where there's shade, elevation changes, et cetera, um, emergency contact information, and any other information that might be useful. So this sign could also be paired with a brochure or online content that people can download on their phones, including photos and audio descriptions of the trail um, to aid in orientation along the way. Next. So we will be replacing some existing signage. So the kiosk and the two interpretive signs in the project area. Um, we would like to know what would be the most valuable replacement for those signs. So we could also add more signage if it would help people to enjoy their visits and learn about the area. Um, and then we could have signage that can contain braille for people who are low vision or blind. Um, and then newer interpretive signs will often have interactive components that people can touch. So people who are low vision or blind, autistic people, people with ADHD and other disabilities can benefit from engaging through touch. And we could pair these signs with the additional online content and brochures, which Monica will talk about in a few minutes. So these two pictures on this slide um, show examples of interactive signage. So the top picture is of a sign with a 3D model of a salmon um, which visitors can touch, while the bottom photo is a 3D paw print, uh, which allows visitors like the one in the photo um, to feel how big the animal in question's paw is. So uh, we want to know if you think signs like this would be more helpful for your visit. Another change um, will be that the restored trail will be flatter and straighter for a longer stretch than it is now. Um, we do need to make sure that it's accessible for uh, maintenance vehicles further than it is currently. Um, so right now, the trail beyond the area around the pond is dirt, but we could add finer grain gravel on the surface to accommodate people using wheelchairs and strollers um, who are dealing with joint pain or recovering from surgery, et cetera. Um, we could also extend the surface for a longer stretch since we are extending the trail for vehicle access already. Um, so we want to know if you think this would be useful and make your trip more enjoyable or your loved one's trips more enjoyable. Um, the picture on this slide is showing a group of people in wheelchairs, as well as a man with an orange backpack uh, using a fine grain flat trail um, in a pretty arid area. So when the trailhead reopens, the existing bench that we've seen a couple times already um, will be replaced with an accessible bench that allows people to use mobility devices to access it. So we can consider also adding one or two more benches in the restored work area. Um, we would need to maintain space for maintenance vehicles, but we could add seating at one or two additional viewpoints. Um, Seating close to the trailhead is very helpful for, for example, elderly people and people with fatigue related illness um, or disabilities to relax and enjoy nature close to the trailhead. Um, so the top photo is showing the current park bench, which is wooden, log inspired and fits the historical design of the trail entrance that we currently have. Um, but there, it's also pushed up against the bushes around it. And so the bottom photo is showing a more accessible bench with railing to help people stand up and sit down, as well as room next to the bench for those who might be using mobility devices and need a place to park. 
So I'm now going to pass this back to Monica, who will talk to you about um, some additional ideas we have um, that are more related to online and um, off-site uh, changes. It's the famous unmute button. Thank you, Madeline. Um, so this is Monica again. And so I'm going to continue on and talk about some other options. Um, I do want to say, as we look at this picture of lovely Coal Creek winding through the forest, this is a really fun project for me. I'm a big wildlife buff. And there is a lot of wildlife in this area, including bears and cougars. I have not seen a cougar yet, but I have seen a paw print. Um, but really a beautiful area and it's a really special area for people in Bellevue when you leave Coal Creek Parkway and you start down the trail the noise of the parkway disappears and suddenly you're in really wild nature so you're seeing this image again of Coal Creek it's one of my favorite images what's really lovely is when there's a salmon release you can actually see coho salmon uh, winding their way up, splashing through the cobbles on their way to spawn. Next. So to help people appreciate this really amazing and rare area, one of the ideas we had was to create trail guides. So when we talked about our on-site improvements, they really are limited to the county's work area. Guides and brochures can include the whole co Coal Creek Trail. The city of Bellevue already has a great interpretive program and theme that covers that area that we could include in some of the content that I'll be talking about. This image shows a page from a trail guide from the city uh, um, from Boulder Mar Mountain Parks, sorry, in Colorado. The arid area that, uh, that Madeline showed is Boulder Mountain Parks. They have great accessible recreation. Uh, at Boulder Mountain Parks. And they have a great trail guide to help people, as Madeline said, plan their trips, enjoy their trips. So trail guides have a lot of similar things, maps, culture and history, nature. Accessible trail guides will have accessible maps that really help people plan. So you'll see things like, what is the trail surface? Here it does transition from gravel to dirt and it can get muddy. We need to tell people that. Is there shade? So people who are, have had any sort of spinal injury can actually lose the ability to regulate their temperature very well and to sweat. They need shade. So people need to know where the shade is, especially in Colorado, right? This is a pretty shady area. You might not see that, but we can talk about trail grade and side slope. If you're using a mobility device, side slope matters because your wheelchair or walk or whatever is suddenly at an angle. Okay, we can talk about seating. If, um, there is signage along the way, as I said, and historic information. There also, the city of Bellevue has emergency contact information on markers. So the trail guides can be hard copy online and you can download it and print on demand. We can make audio versions of this. We can make video of this. So there's a number of options for us to do different formats for trail guides. Next. The other type of information guide that we can create, it's becoming more common now, is called a sensory guide. Massachusetts Audubon has really great accessible natural areas. They've really prioritized accessibility. The image here is the cover of a guide to a sensory trail. Um, and the sensory trail has sensory stops. And this works really well for people who um, are autistic, have ADHD. It's not just people who uh, have or need to rely on different senses, say low vision or blind people um, or people who are deaf. It is, there are a range of people that benefit from these sensory guides. Think about people who live with chronic depression or anxiety. A connection to nature can be very soothing and relaxing. So giving them places where they can stop and just ex experience the nature around them and connect with them can be really a healing experience. Again, all guides can be in hard copy, downloadable, printable. You can have audio versions. You can make them in a braille version. There's a number of options to make accessible guides. Next. 
The next idea we had was to create accessible maps. As Madeline said, the one at the trailhead will be replaced. We're working with City of Bellevue GIS folks. It will be replaced with an accessible map. Currently, the, the one that's there wouldn't be considered to be in the current standards. The uh, other thing you can do is take that accessible map and make it something that people can carry along with. Again, to help them navigate the trail, people want to know where they're at, how far they really feel like going and when to turn around and where features are. The other neat thing that's coming out, especially with 3D printers are tactile maps. The image on this slide shows a hand touching a white paper with raised elements on it. And then behind it is a gravel trail, grass, and trees. This person is navigating a walk through a historic site, and they're using this tactile map. It can be paired with an audio tour so that they can not only navigate, but get information about the area. So tactile maps are something that we can also consider as part of this uh, project. Next. This is an example of something we'll really need to know if people want uh, want to see. These are a big lift, but they have been online apps have been really valuable to help people with disabilities connect and enjoy the outdoors. The image here shows the app install page from a place called Grandfather Mountain. So the idea is you make the app. It has a map on it. The map actually can trace your progress. You download your smartphone, it traces your progress whether you have cell phone service or not. You certainly don't in the Coal Creek Ravine. There can be information about wildlife, about culture and history. You can, on some of these apps, put audio. You can put video with an ASL interpreter. So you can actually get a guided tour that you download and take with you on the trail. Um, these can be used both on a smartphone and on computers. This is a big lift. So we're, we would work with the city of Bellevue to, to make sure we had the right content. King County would invest in a subscription to an app and turn it over to the city of Bellevue. And then city of Bellevue does have a lift to keep it up to date. Okay, so for things like this, we really want to know, is there value to this? Should we invest in it or should we think about other things? Next. Finally, I'm going to talk about transportation. So full disclosure, we're the sewer people. Uh, I do not have a magic wand where transportation is concerned. Uh, however, as Blaine said, we are taking all input. It is not only going to the city of Bellevue. We're posting everything online, and I am sharing with my colleagues in King County Parks. Um, so we will let them know if transportation is of interest. Transportation can be a huge barrier for people with disabilities. It can be a huge barrier in general to equitable access to the outdoors, okay? Coal Creek, the Red Cedar trailhead, any of the trailheads are only accessible by car. So you either have to have a car, ride with somebody else, or you have to use a ride share service. Okay, so ride share services are not free and they can get quite expensive when they're under demand. Ride share services are also really not set up to serve people with disabilities. So what transportation options are there out, are out there now? Well, King County Parks and King County Metro are partnered with many sponsors to uh, pilot a program called Trailhead Direct. So this is one example, um, and there may be other things we can do. This is an example where they decided to reduce traffic, improve safety, safe access to trailheads, and, and really increase equitable access to the outdoors by providing a bus service to popular trailheads in the area from park and rides or places that have public transportation. In the left image, there are people with backpacks and walking poles at a trailhead, leaving a green and yellow Metro access bus. On the right, there's a map of the current stops for 2021. So whether it's trailhead direct or something else, 
let us know if we should be passing on to all of our partners the transportation to this particular trailhead would be desirable, public transportation. Let us know if that's the case. It certainly could help with parking congestion at that trailhead. It is such a popular trailhead that it's often really, really quite full. So if, the, uh, if a trailhead service of some kind or a bus stop would help, do let us know. Next. So I want to summarize what we've gone over. We have a big sewer project to give more capacity and move an active sewer pipe away from a creek. We're going to close a very popular trailhead for three years. We will remove everything and replace it. We need to meet current accessibility standards and replace what's there, but we have some options to make things actually better accessibility wise when they come back. So we've described some on site options, signage seatings, hard copy trail sides, things like that. And we have online options as well that we've discussed. So next, now what we're going to do is we're going to transition into the discussion. So uh, just to remind everybody we're recording um, and to be respectful in the chat, uh, but be honest, right? So we came up with some ideas. We have some approaches. Are they valuable? Are they not? Be super honest about that. So what we're going to do is um, turn on our videos as presenters so you can see who we are. And then um, we will unmute everybody so you can use your audio and either in the Q&A chat or by audio, feel free to ask us questions. So Madeline and Blaine, do you wanna start your video? And you can unmute Madeline and Blaine, are you there? I am here. Oh, good, okay. I, my view is really peculiar here. So, um, so Madeline, do you want to go ahead and describe you as they see you in video? So, for sure. Um, hi, everyone. Again, I'm Madeline. Um, so, as you can see, to uh, well, I don't know. I guess today my background is blurred. Um, I'm not wearing my glasses today. Um, there's quite a bit of sunlight. I've got brown straight hair, brown eyes. Um, for reference, I'm about 5'2". So yeah, that's me. Blaine, how about you? Sure thing. Um, hello again, folks. This is Blaine. Um, I, uh, you may have just seen the top of my puppy's head if you happen to be watching my camera in this moment because she decided to make an appearance. Uh, but in addition to that, what you'll see if you saw me would be Long curly hair that's kind of off to the side, different than the photo that I took about a year and a half ago. My COVID hobby was growing out my hair and learning how to manage uh, curls for the first time. And so you'll see hair that is curly off to one side. I'm wearing big glasses that are kind of a leopard print-ish kind of thing. I have a blue button-down shirt with white checkers in it. And I am in front of a white wall with a mirror and a plant, and I, you can see one lamp. Great. And I am Monica. Why can't I see my own video? I'm going to describe myself without looking at myself and see how that works. Um, so my pandemic hair, like I said, looks like my regular hair and much worse than Blaine's. I am, Blaine is so put together. I'm getting fashion advice from him as well as buying him lunch for being such a good partner. Um, so I am wearing a denim shirt. I also have glasses. These are really wild and colorful for me, but not really. Um, I am at our Brightwater Center and I am sitting in a meeting room and what's behind me is a window looking out onto a treatment plant. So that's who we are. And so do we have everybody unmuted, Annie? Sorry, it took me a moment to unmute myself. Um, yes, at the moment, everyone should have the availability to mute or unmute themselves. If you are having any trouble with that function, will you please chat the panelists and I will go through and try to give you permissions again. Um, also a reminder, if you are hoping to submit feedback through one of our ASL interpreters, please also chat the panelists 
so that we can promote you so we can turn your video on. Thank you. Are you accepting questions at this time? Yes, we are. Oh, okay. Yeah, my name is Ron Yeager. I have, um, I live pretty close to the trailhead. Um, actually, I'm closer to the trailhead, which is just up Forest Drive, if you're familiar with that one. It's yes on, on the map. It's probably 100 yards up from Coal Creek Parkway. And one of my questions was whether during this three year period, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a camera on here. I've only got microphone, microphone access, but um, one of my questions is whether you would um, leave that trailhead, it's a small trailhead, but whether you would leave that open and whether they're building a, a detour around the work area from that trailhead. Yes, so the detour that is being constructed now will allow people to go from Forest, Par uh, Forest Drive and pass our construction area. And that trail detour will be permanent. So it, it'll be a permanent trail section. So yes, that trailhead will be reopened. Um, and we're looking at options to make, to see how we might, um, get more people to the forest drive area. So there are discussions going on with the city of Bellevue and our team's coming with, up with some ideas because the Red Cedar Trailhead would be closed. Um, how can we get more people to the forest drive area and whether they're parking or it's public transportation or something. So we're working on that right now, but you will have access through that area. It won't be quiet going past our construction, but you will definitely have access going through that area. You may be able to ask the city too, whether those of us who live on the street right after that trailhead would allow um, or be amenable to people parking in the neighborhood to access the trailhead. Because I think some of us would, we would understand that. But that's probably an issue to bring up with the city. That's actually helpful for me to know because whatever we do up there, we need to do outreach on whatever it would happen on Forest Drive. So it's actually helpful for me to know that as we come out. So you will probably hear from me. These discussions are underway now. Um, you'll probably hear from me at some point on that topic. We'll have a number of community meetings on different topics like traffic. Um, and that one will be something that you'll hear from me and we can talk about what can happen up there, any concerns you might have. Mm, that's great. Yeah, thank you for making the accommodation for that trailhead. Appreciate that. And all of your ideas sounded really good. Um, just a couple of notes I took while going through this, um, listening to your presentation. There's a, maybe you're already familiar with the Newcastle Historical Society. And yes. So they may be able to provide some great information too about the history near that trailhead. If there were any interpretive signs that you wanted to add with some of the mining and foresting history history there. And let me ask you, Ron, are these like, would you use all of these things? Do you have a favorite thing? Is there something that would make this area that you're like, wow, that would really make this a richer area for me as I, as I use the trail as a neighbor on a regular basis? Yeah, a couple of things that as I walk the trail and I've walked it for almost 25 years now, uh, I've seen the trail progressively uh, get better, be better maintained and more accessible during all seasons of the year. Um, used to be pretty treacherous in some places further down from the parking lot particularly. But um, even closer to the parking lot, it's, it's much better now for quite a ways. So that's all been really good. And I, I think the idea is about being accessible to people who um, have disabil disabilities that may require a wheelchair, for instance, or they may have some 
know, all-terrain kind of tires on the wheelchairs too that allow them to go down the trail. Um, this one is nice and flat. And so if somebody were to be able to get from their car with a lift uh, out to the trail and be able to move up the trail to maybe a couple of benches that would be close to where they could view the creek and watch the creek flow, I think that would be really helpful for them. So Ron, I'm, I'm gonna piggyback off of that here because I, I feel genuinely curious. This is Blaine. And what you may have heard in my introduction is that I use a wheelchair. So let me ask you, as someone who seems really familiar with the trail, as a wheelchair user myself, uh, I hear you saying it's gotten much better. Could it be even better? Could I, could I get, I mean, certainly it could, right? But where would you, I hear you saying like getting to the creek. So in your mind, that's a feature I would really enjoy if I could easily and smoothly get all the way to the creek. Is that something that I, you feel like just kind of having walked it that I could easily do now? Or is there modifications that we could make to make that even better? I think at the present time, you, would um, you wouldn't be able to transfer to a bench. You'd have to stay in the chair, but you could um, probably get close to a creek on some of the side trails that get you close to the water. Um, okay. Some of that trail, at, at least in the summer and the spring anyway, is pretty heavily overgrown with brush and all, and you can't see the creek, especially if you're down lower, um, close to the ground until you get um, to a trail that allows you to move off towards the creek a little bit. So you so, might create a couple little point, uh, places where you can navigate out to the trail and put a bench there. So maybe feedback uh, that I'm hearing here would be if we could make it, you know, just as accessible as we possibly can to get to a place where you can view the river easily if you use a mobility device. That would be a recommendation that you might make to us. I, and, uh, and also what I'm hearing you say is try and find a space where year round I would still get to kind of rest and sit there and, and enjoy. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, and I don't think you'd need to go real far either. You might like to go far enough to get away from some of the heavy traffic noise, because as you've noted, it gets quieter as you move in. Um, mm. But you wouldn't have to go real far. And there also used to be a, a pond there. I don't know if that's going to be restored or if it will be more of a creek, but the pond was also a nice place to sit. Well, thank you, Ron, I appreciate that. Does anyone else have thoughts about kind of how far the trail should go? as far as being super accessible and creating kind of features where folks who have mobility issues or maybe sensory issues would get some overwhelm. Question for Monica. Yes. How far up the trail are you allowed to work? And where would this rest, how far up would the restoration go? That is an excellent question. And it's also a good idea for me to promote our online open house, um, which we'll send you a link to. Uh, Madeline, who is my amazing summer intern, made a virtual tour to show you where it ends. So right now, the flat gravel area ends at a, a wood split rail fence. Um, and then it turns to dirt. It will go around the corner that will end up being flatter and then close to the first bridge. So right now there is a Bellevue, a city of Bellevue maintenance hole on the left side. You probably have seen it in the winter time but it's kind of covered in leaves in the summer. And there is a King County maintenance hole across the creek from there. That is the end of our physical work area. Um, and we need to be able to get maintenance vehicles. Currently, we can't get vehicles in there to actually inspect those connections. So when we reestablish the connection to the city of Bellevue, some of those maintenance holes are going away, but we need to maintain that connection and we'll have vehicle access to that point before the bridge. And that's where we have an opportunity um, there is a wide flat area that goes to the creek right there. Um, it, we can certainly resurface with a finer grain. So it's a 3 8 minus versus a 5 8 minus. 
um, gravel so that it is accessible for wheelchairs and strollers. Um, so we're not a whole lot further down the trail, but it's certainly farther than they are now. And it's definitely where it's a lot quieter. There are at least two good viewpoints um, near that bridge. Um, and you do get outside the noise range. So it's that would be great to get that far. You could see kingfishers and salmon in the stream and uh, possibly roll a wheelchair close to the stream. Um, you are in the floodplain there. So all of that trail in a 300 year storm would probably get washed out or at least covered with water. Something to consider. Right, it is a maintenance issue. That is the one reason that we would never put pavement there. And, and forest service standards for accessibility on trailheads are changing. Um, so it's no longer that you have to put pavement and you can imagine that pavement in a flood um, chipping away and being very problematic. So, um, but we do have to maintain that vehicle access uh, going in and so, so that we can inspect our own pipes. And also it will help Bellevue Parks with maintenance access as well. I mean, we've had the comment that maintain better for winter access and then they'll be able to get farther down the trail with vehicles than they can get now as well. And uh, if Steve, is it, can I ask you, um, so we came up with a whole pile of ideas. What did you think about some of the other options that we presented? Well, I like the expanded interpretive signage um, and even the 3D fish and the paw print I, would be great. I'm, I'm con concerned about vandalism and replacement, but it's worth a try. Um, you know, in the total cost of the project, that's a very minimal thing. Um, I like the downloadable content idea, uh, which should be helpful to everybody. Um, I guess I'm one concern I have is whether this might attract motorcycles, uh, motorized bikes, or nighttime usage, uh, teenage beer parties, that sort of thing. I'm an ex-park manager, so I, I tend to look the world that way. Yeah, that's actually good feedback and um, all areas in this region have had issues with a lot of not appropriate park use so that's super helpful feedback. Um, there are bollards in the beginning of that trail um, that you hope would be a barrier but as a park manager you know that we may need to do think about more than that right than bollards but no this is super helpful um, input for us, you know, to know what works and what doesn't work. And I think at your viewpoints, that's an opportunity for interpretive signage. Um, the talking about kingfishers, um, raccoons and bears coming down to get spawned out salmon, um, caddis fly larvae in the stream bed, um, the different types of rocks you're going to find because of the mining history and the brick making history. Yeah, it's a really fascinating area. And we have been working very closely both with the Muckleshoot tribes and with Bellevue Utilities who manages the creek and the salmon. And Bellevue Utilities has encouraged us to do as much education about protecting the creek as we can. They've already put two interpretive signs there to that effect. Um, actually, our uh, each year our scientists from Water and Land Resources have been working with Pacific Science Centers um, uh, Lake Washington Watershed Intern Program to do stream surveys. They do uh, water quality monitoring. So that's super helpful input as well. It, it's a really, really rich area. So there's a lot that we can actually add to that conversation and culture and history, and then also the nature aspect. And it helps because we do need to get, need to get people to protect this stream. It's really a rare chance to restore a salmon and urban salmon run. And so we're kind of excited about being able to do, we're water quality people, about being able to do some education as well and create some content. One other thought, um, the you're disconnecting the old sewer pipe, but you're not actually removing it from the stream bed. Is that correct? It's, not, it's being de decommissioned and right now the county is working with the city of Bellevue 
on what removal looks like. So the thing to know about this pipe is that a lot of it is inaccessible, right? So it's a priority to remove it where it can become a problem, a fish barrier if it gets scoured out. Um, some of the history which you can find online because we've talked to the community about this, we've done four or five repairs. We're well into the millions of dollars. When the creek floods, it scours the banks out. It's moving around. It's a very floody creek and it's moving around. It scours the banks out and exposes the pipe. The pipe has not uh, failed yet, but it could. Um, so in areas where the pipe could become a barrier to fish, it definitely needs to be removed, okay? And so the county and the city are working right now to figure out where removal occurs. To take it out through the whole ravine would mean tremendous environmental impact. We literally have to build roads and take down tons of trees. So we're trying to figure out what's the best balance between protecting the creek and then um, and not harming the rest of the environment. That being said, the county's commitment has always been if there is pipe remaining there, it's still our pipe. <laughs> and so if there's any issues into the future, the county would work to address those. Last August, we did do uh, a stream bank shoring up around a maintenance hole. Even if the pipe's decommissioned, if the city contacts us, we still have, and there's pipe left there that's becoming an issue. It's something that we need to respond to. So great question, actually. And then I see we have a question in the Q&A. Uh, it says, access by car to the Red Cedar parking area when driving south on Coal Creek Parkway is challenging since no left turn into the parking area is allowed. Very true. Would it be possible to put in a two-way turn lane in Coal Creek Parkway? This would help with trailhead direct access too, if that becomes possible. That would be an amazingly wonderful thing. Um, the it's not within the purview of the project to make a major traffic change. There's a lot that goes into making a, a traffic change in the area. I will, we have that feedback from you and I appreciate it. Um, and we will definitely be sharing that. But the purview of this project doesn't allow us to suddenly add traffic into the sewer project. Um, it would definitely be a benefit, I agree. That's a difficult turn and there's a lot of illegal turns there. Um, but it's just not something that we're going to be able to accomplish. But I do want to recognize that that is really good input and an excellent idea. So from the perspective of kind of a signage in general, and uh, Monica talked about a lot of different things. She talked about the uh, the um, online materials that could be created, but she also talked about physical uh, kind of trail guides that tell you about what's coming up and, and give you an opportunity to kind of decide, I'm going to stop here, or I think I could take it to the next bench, or, oh, it looks like the surface grade changes, I may want to think about that. I, I heard, uh, I heard, I think it was Ron, or no, I'm sorry, it was Steve's talk, talking about how the downloadable content was interesting for you. Would it also be good to have that physical uh, that physical document in hand or or access to such something that you could print and bring with you? Or is does that feel like uh, our our time and energy could be spent elsewhere? Yeah, and to add on to Blaine's, we don't want to leave paper also at the trailhead just to become litter. Um, but you know, would it help if we if we did create a brochure rack in a kiosk and and then we had things that people could carry with them for orientation or culture or history? This is Ron again. I I do find those things to be really helpful. Uh, they're at some of the other trailheads. I think the, in Newcastle, there's a trailhead at Cougar Mountain that has some of those brochures with information. And, and they're really good. They have nice little maps and they talk about some of the history in the area too. So that's really helpful, but I understand the concern about you know, paper and all being left around too. 
Uh, from, sometimes the, the websites like All Trails have some pretty good descriptions too that people can look at on their phones. That's some good information. Yeah, and that's really good input. So the we can look at um, if we do create hard copy trail guides, the nice thing is, like I said, we can make them in Braille, we can translate them into various different languages. If we made hard copy trail guides, we could make it something that was available at um, like the ranger station nearby um, or a central place or city hall. Um, you know, so that people could pick them up or they could be available to be sent to people um, who are interested in using the trail. So does that, so that sounds like something that you would appreciate having available? That would be great. I, I think especially if you have a, uh, it sounds like you're serious about exploring the option of a ranger station near there too. There is, um, so I'm blanking, Why Lewis Creek is, do oh. I, yeah, is near there. And so I know they've got a number of, like I've picked up there, some, the city has done some really beautiful park guides and they've translated them, um, which is super helpful, you know, so they've got a brochure rack there. So that's what I'm thinking, or Mercer Slough Nature Center or other city locations where we could find a brochure rack. Um, there's one in City Hall, I know when we go and meet folks there. And so maybe we could find locations so that we just don't have paper sitting at the trailhead and then getting rained on. This is something that's happened with us with flyers and newsletters. So if it's of interest, then we will find ways to create them and then stock them places. That would be great to have a rack there, especially if it's monitored by somebody and the access is a little controlled. Super, yeah. No, that's very much appreciated input. And Ron, did you have any thoughts about, um, so we can restore the kiosk in a horizontal orientation, just with more accessible content, non-glare surface, that means accessibility standards. If there were a bigger kiosk at the trailhead and more information, is that someplace you would stop or linger? Or is we, should we really focus more on guides and things people could take with them? Uh, and anybody else feel free to weigh in. I, you know, we're, we're trying to balance and make sure that we're meeting people's needs. Yeah, I, I, I think both of them um, have been useful to me. I've stopped and lingered at some of the signboards too and, and read the information on them. And they are really nice. Um, it's nice not to have to carry paper a lot of the time if, if you don't want to. And uh, it, it depends on how much information you have to present at that site. If there's quite a bit, then a larger signboard could be really helpful. So what kind of, uh, let me just piggyback up this because you've got me really curious thinking about kiosks. Um, it, it, would there be opportunity, do you think, I, I heard somebody say that um, for folks who, who may not be able to get very far down the trail at all, if we created, if, what kind of content would make you kind of come to the head of the trail and sit and, and if that was the, the majority of your experience was maybe some interpretive signage or some tactile signage and, and a really kicking kiosk, what kind of information would make it a really kicking kiosk for you? What, what, what information would you recommend kind of, if that, was the, if that was the highlight because you couldn't get very far down the trail, what kind of information would you want to see at a really neat kiosk that would keep you there? There are probably a, a number of opinions. I, I don't know how many people are actually online here, but uh, for me, I'm a history buff. So um, I enjoy all the history about uh, the rails and the logging and the uh, uh, forestation, the deforestation that went on there and how some of the old growth is missing. And, and there's a lot of new growth there. Um, there, are, there are things along the trail to view that are uh, remnants of the past history of the rails, for instance, as there's wheels from the rail cars. And some of that signage already exists further up that the Newcastle Historical Society has put in. But if I knew there was that much to view, and, and actually I just went on a kind of a guided geologist uh, from a website that the geologist had who described the, the Renton layer and the coal 
scenes that go through here on the Primrose Trail. It was fascinating. I went with a group of hikers and we spent probably an hour or more just wandering around looking at the history in the Primrose Trail. There's a lot there. You could, you could present quite a bit if you had a large signboard and that would draw people, I think, to go down the trail and explore. Um, but there's so much to talk about. There's, there's the fish, there's the fact that you're, you're bringing the salmon in again, how that's being done, um, how you uh, recover some of these, uh, restore some of these uh, creek beds and all uh, from something that was ravaged pretty heavily by all the industry that was there and maybe a hundred years ago and how you're planning to bring it back to what it might have been like before that. Uh, that's all fascinating. So maybe a three-sided a three-sided kiosk that had a ton of information uh, around restoration and history and and what folks I, I really liked your idea of what folks would actually see on the trail uh, so that if I couldn't get very far and I wanted to know what was kind of further uh, what I what I heard you kind of say and correct me if I'm wrong is that actually highlighting some of the things that are on the trail might be useful for people who couldn't get to them. Is yes. that what I'm hearing? Some markers on the map. If you had printed maps, you could put little markers on them. How many awesome. miles in they were? Awesome. Mm -hmm. Do other folks have ideas about kind of what would make this uh, the the trail head itself? What would make it kind of a a, a nice stop. I have a thought. This is Franya Bryant. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I really appreciate um, signage in the kiosk that tells me uh, about the plant life and or the animals, things that I would see along the way. Um, and so and I love the idea of the 3D uh, you know, touch uh, aspect too of some of the signage. I was also thinking that I am, I am sort of not new tech oriented and I have been always surprised how many people think of, oh, well, I don't need to take that brochure. I will just take a photo of it and have it along with me. So if we were trying to, um, avoid the use of paper or litter, um, just a sign in the kiosk that says, or and a big um, information sheet saying, take a picture of this. <laughs> it might be a way to encourage people to, they could still get the information, but they wouldn't have to um, have paper to do it. That's an excellent suggestion. Thank you, Franya. And um, so one of the things what we will be taking out a lot of vegetation, there's actually, I will tell you an advantage to this. Um, the city of Bellevue is working to restore, we talked about that historic forest in this area. They are working to try to restore it. Um, what's happening is those deciduous trees, the maples and alders kind of take over and shade out conifers. Mm -hmm. uh, King County will be in there doing vegetation maintenance and monitoring in the work area and any other uh, natural mitigation areas. We expect the permit conditions will be for at least 10 years. This is a real advantage for helping kind of jump start getting the forest in that area because we'll be taking care of it for a very long period of time mm -hmm. to get it established and kind of control the things that are preventing those conifers from coming back and and taking over the forest once again and becoming giants. So there'll be a lot of information about restoration. I do work doing communications for our mitigation and monitoring group and they've learned a lot about uh, landscape restoration over time. The other element that could be of interest, especially if we did have an area where people can approach the creek, is we will have to do stream restoration. And stream restoration has really changed over time. And I, I part of my job is really, really fun. I got to walk the creek with the fish biologist from the Muckleshoot tribe and Kit Paulson, who retired from uh, Bellevue Utilities. And Kit had a lifetime of knowledge, and so did the biologist from the Muckleshoots, who's also retired. And they kind of talked through a lot of how our thinking about stream restoration and how 
fish travel upstreams, how that's changed. So I think we can share a lot of that. And it's also a good opportunity for us to do some water quality messaging there mm -hmm. because we all affect waterways. And so um, if we want to engage and connect people to this place, um, that would be helpful. So I am hearing that we may be able to find, have some accessible pullouts with some signage further down that may help to augment the experience. Yes, I really, this is a wonderful opportunity to talk about restoration and how, how it's done and the value <laughs> of it. So good, I'm glad they're, you're thinking about that. And that's super helpful. So we're almost done. And before we finish, um, Annie, can you flip to the last slide? I wanted to let you know, so this is a community meeting. What we have long ago stopped just having one community meeting and shutting down a conversation. We have an online open house and virtual tour. My wonderful intern, Madeline, who's with us tonight, created these. Um, you can actually visit that. There's a survey associated with it that asks you some of these same questions. So when you leave this meeting or if you know other people who weren't able to attend and should engage, please, uh, we'll send you the link in an email afterward. Please get them to that online open house and survey and just share with us everything that we should know. As we said, we are getting information here. This information can actually help King County Parks, our water and land resources, and City of Bellevue Parks kind of think about future planning efforts as well as this location at Coal Creek. Um, everybody's always welcome to uh, contact me. Um, so it's Monica Vanderveren. You're gonna hate this. I'm gonna spell my email, but I need to spell my email. It is M-O-N-I-C-A dot V for Victor, A-N-D-E-R-V-I-E-R-E-N at King County, it's K-I-N-G-C-O-U-N-T-Y dot gov. So you can email me or call me at 206-477 five five zero two the other thing i want to say is we're also available to meet with community groups and organizations we're glad to come and talk one-on-one -on -one, um, or do it remotely if that's more convenient so definitely if you know folks that should engage and should give us some feedback if you have more feedback after this our conversation is not over the online open house will be up for a few more weeks and you can always contact us as we start to develop um, final plans, we'll share them with people. And then we'll have a whole content development. We will be developing content somewhere, online, brochures, on site. And so we'll also be working with the public. If you go to our website, you can actually sign up for listserv updates. So we'll send you emails. We try not to send too many out, but it's an opportunity for you to keep up with the project as well. So with that, I want to thank everybody. So thank you, Blaine, for joining us tonight. And um, I want to thank everybody who took the time to attend. I know meetings, community meetings are not always fun, um, but we super appreciated everybody who spent the time with us and do continue to give us feedback that you think would be helpful. This was really a valuable experience for us. And Annie, with that, do you want to 